Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Betsy Woodruff of National Review and for Jim Garrity today. Good, bad, crazy martinis for you as usual. Betsy, it's always great to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always fun. Well, the good martini today is courtesy of Bob Woodward. He was on uh, Fox News Sunday, uh, the uh, panel, and they were talking about the fact, of course, that Paul Ryan and Patty Murray were able to put together this budget deal that will avoid a government shutdown if it passes the Senate for the next little while here. And Bob Woodward had this to explain why the deal actually got done. I think this budget deal worked, quite uh, frankly. Let's uh, go right to the center of this because Obama was not part of the negotiations. He is not a good negotiator. And I agree with Bill. I think Paul Ryan comes off as somebody who no one, even Bill, is not going to say Ryan is a conservative. He is a conservative, but the philosophy that he employed here is very significant, sitting down with the Democrats and saying, what is our common ground? What can we agree on? And it is indeed small, but it, it, it's a step forward. Obviously, conservatives are a little bit split over Paul Ryan's performance on this bill. But the point about the president, Betsy, and uh, it would have been interesting if Woodward had gone into it a little more about why he's not a good negotiator. Is he, you know, too uh, rigid? Is he just looking to create gridlock rather than solve problems and so forth? But uh, Woodward has been pretty unvarnished on Obama, especially over the last couple of years, and basically saying right out that if you want to get anything done in Washington, leave Obama out of the equation. Yeah, either leave Obama out of the equation or leave Congress out of the equation. I mean, that's <laughs> how the president's accomplished. Everything he's accomplished in this time of divided government is just by increasing executive power and, and bypassing typical congressional means of uh, decision making. It makes sense, certainly, that, that Woodward would make this allegation given you know, the president's pretty resounding failure to get any of his major policy provisions pushed through Congress during divided government. And I think it's also important to bear in mind that the president's background is not in you know fields that often require a lot of negotiation. doesn't have a strong business background. He's been a college professor. Unlike Ryan, who has a lot of business connections, you know, it's from a family that's very interested in, in market-based issues where these kind of skills are important. It's an interesting dynamic to see play out and certainly one that I think is of interest to conservatives. Betsy, do you get the sense that Democrats, as well as Republicans, uh, based on your work on the Hill, that, that they're not really keen on the president getting involved in these negotiations either? They think they can get more done without him? I think so, yeah. I think whenever Biden comes to negotiate, people are happy about it. You know, Biden's a creature of the Senate, very plugged in, actually knows how to sort of hash deals out. But I think the president is seen as, as such a polarizing, um, politically toxic figure that, you know, neither side is thrilled when he tries to sit down on the negotiating table. We're almost a year still from the midterm elections, and if he's that much of a, of a hindrance, is he already quacking? You know, you hate to be the person who says that this early in the game, especially because he's coming out of a pretty ugly six-month stretch. But as of right now, he, you know, he's, he's not an asset to red state Democratic senators running for re-election. Doesn't seem like much of an asset to a number of the Democratic congressmen. All right. Well, on to the bad martini now. And uh, one of the things we learned last week, of course, is that given that healthcare.gov still isn't fully put together and there are uh, computer glitches going on, that a lot of people who have signed up for Obamacare haven't even had the opportunity to pay for it, which has led to problems about whether or not they'll have coverage come the first of the year. Now we've got more problems. This is uh, from uh, Fox News. The Obama administration acknowledged this week that the federal Obamacare website failed to record insurance policy purchases for as many as 15,000 Americans. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services on Saturday said the transactions were either not recorded or had errors and attributed the problem to larger technical issues. So, Betsy, on the one hand, you have people who can't buy it yet because the proper procedure isn't in place a lot of the time on these sites. And now the people that actually have tried to do it and, and think they've paid for it, thousands of them now find out there's no record of it. It's phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just one of these things where you know, you just kind of have to laugh because... Otherwise, you'd pull all your hair out. And on the one hand, the, the federal government has been able to run an incredibly technologically sophisticated phone spying pro program through the NSA. <laughs> but on the other hand, it can't even tell people if they have insurance. I mean, this isn't that complicated. It's not like you're trying to build any sort of you know magical next generation technology. Like the president had the most sophisticated technology operation for his campaign. 
But uh, now that he's not running for re-election, all of a sudden the technology just kind of starts taking a, a nosedive. So it's totally bizarre. I'm baffled by how, how bad all this has been. But as the president informed us not just a number of weeks ago, Betsy, it, it turns out that buying health insurance is complicated. It's, it's hard. Breaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to uh, martini number three now. And I would say stop me if you've heard this before, but then you would stop me. So I'm not going to say that. Uh, (laughs) Here is uh, Donald Trump on Fox and Friends talking about, get ready, that people just are dying to have him run for governor of New York next year. They very very strongly wanted to see me, and they very strongly want me to do it. So let's see what happens. You know, I had something else in mind, and this was not actually something I wanted to do. I love the state. I love the country. But they feel very strongly about it. So at some point, I'll make a decision. He's done this twice on a presidential race, at least maybe three times now, New York governor. Betsy, we know he's never going to actually run, right? I can't imagine a universe where he does. It's just, it's so entertaining. Like, Donald Trump is is such a, a polarizing character that if you ever write about him or have him on your show or do anything Trump-related, people immediately jump on it and talk about it. You know, I, I interviewed Trump a while back and wrote a piece about his uh, rumors about the you know, 2016 presidential bid, and the response was it got a lot of traffic and people were really crabby about Donald Trump getting any coverage. So what are you going to do? Like, yeah, it's hard to imagine him running for anything. But clearly he enjoys the spotlight. You know, he enjoys the rumor mills. He likes saying he had something else in mind. Ooh, I wonder what the other thing is. Wow, so interesting. And it gives, you know, salon writers a chance to bash this guy who's essentially an an avatar of corporate absurdity. So what are you going to do? It's Trump. I just don't think his ego could take the hit of a loss. I think that's probably what's keeping him out of it. Probably, and on the presidential level, I'm sure he knew he would lose. And in New York, right. uh, if he ran as a Republican or anything else, I, I don't know that Cuomo's that unpopular that he would be that vulnerable. So I can't, I cannot imagine a universe where New Yorkers would elect Donald Trump to be their governor. That's just totally beyond, totally outside of anything that I can conceive of. And yeah, I think you're right. Like, what happens if he loses, you know? And also, he'd have to go through all the scrutiny that, you know, that any candidate for major office goes through, which, uh, you know, he hasn't historically taken scrutiny of his wealth, especially well in the past. And I think to to have to deal with, you know, all the all the, you know, nuts and bolts of politics is probably not not as fun as as he might immediately presume it would be. So now, Betsy, when you did the interview or maybe after it was published, did, did he let you know that he thought it was really, really, really terrific and really huge? <laughs> and, and just fabulous and all that, the, the words that I he always so. keeps trotting I out. I think so, yeah. You know, and it was, and he gave me time, and that was, you know, it was very nice, and his people were very nice, so I, I, I got nothing personal against the guy. <laughs> yeah, it was funny, you know, it's like funny talking to a person and having it be the exact same persona as <laughs> he's the guy who's waving his middle finger around on reality TV. <laughs> that comes with the territory. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Uh, it's all part of the job, Betsy. Good job. <laughs> thanks. Uh, and thanks for filling in for Jim today. We'll talk to you later. And if we don't talk to you before then, have a very Merry Christmas. Sounds good. You too. Betsy Woodruff in for Jim Garrity today. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Jim should be back on Tuesday. Join us then for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch.